Okay. So you still lose something when you go to war. Yeah. All right. Would you all agree? Sometimes war is needed to make change. What kind of change are you talking about? Okay. The Revolutionary War. What did you say, Emmanuel? Ah. Ah, okay. Consequences, but maybe not a good war. Savannah? Speak up so they can hear you. Please. Ah, because they wanted to keep the peace. Um, during World War II, did you all hear those answers? Okay. Kind of, yeah. Okay, so there is, um, this is, this is really when you get into the philosophy of war, when you get into the philosophy of, um, of politics, when you get into ethics, you know, all these things are called into question about good war, bad peace, bad war, good war, um, you know, churches weigh in on this, there are politicians who weigh in on this, there are consequences, obviously, there are um, many aspects of our society that weigh in whenever war happens, right? So, there was never a good war or a bad peace. Benjamin Franklin, remember, was officially a Quaker. He was really a, a, a deist. And he was all about what? What was he first and foremost, really? Keeping the country together? Keeping the country together? In, well... He was here before it was a country that was together. So he was about bringing it together, yes, in different ways, but not like we have it today, okay? He was looking to, um, like in the Albany plan, he was looking to uh, create this, this confederation, right? Okay? But, you know, if you go and look at World War II, and you look at the um, the genocide that was happening, and you know the the reasoning behind entering the war or not entering the war, that's where you get into all of those philosophies that um, that have been going on since. Spartus and before, okay? And so you could argue this both ways, and I think you both have pointed out, or you all have pointed out some really good um, aspect of both sides. And uh, so it's always, a, it's always a good quote because you start, you start thinking about how it plays into society at that time, but also how you've seen it um, and how you will see it playing into society even today. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. So... she go we stopped here on 16 the revolution and social change okay egalitarianism among uh, among white males what do you think about egalitarianism what do you think it is number one
Okay. Anybody want to take a stab at it? It, um, it was a change in how classes and how people were viewed as far as classes and authority. So, uh, class structure and becoming equals? That type of thing? Yes. Yes. Um, egalitarianism is creating more of a um, equal standing between white males. So, socially, the, the war changed many, many things, obviously. I mean, 5% uh, of the population died during the revolution, correct? Remember that? Okay. All right. So there was this class, this question of class and gender and race that was all up for public discussion. And with that, you create social change. So you always create social change when those questions come up. No. No, it doesn't always create social change when those things come up. Okay? Um, why do they only address the white males? They're the only one with their opinion? Is that what you said? They're the only ones who they wanted us to be opinion of. Ah, okay. All right. That's a good stab at it. Um, were women counted? No. Not officially, no. Okay. How about black men? No. How about black free men? No. No. Okay. How about slaves? No. No. How about natives? So if you're going to have egalitarianism, it's only going to be among white males, right? At this time. Okay. All right. So those, uh, those views, however, between the white males themselves were actually shifting. And they were shifting because you had, uh, had non-elite white men who had served in the military. Right? You had served against, uh, or for George Washington, you had served with uh, Nathaniel Green, Henry Knox, any of, the, any of the people within the military, and you were all fighting for the same thing. And remember how they didn't, no, they no longer wanted to defer to their betters, right? So in order for the, um, the officers to create a, uh, a system, there was still hierarchy, but they didn't treat the non-landowning white males, or they didn't treat the, um, the merchants or anyone else. They didn't treat them with disdain, okay? And previously, and, and throughout the, the world, and, and even today, you'll find disdain amongst elite toward um, people who are not elite, okay, the non-elites, right? Would you agree? Has anyone personally seen that? In what way? Political stance, okay. I'm... I haven't read enough about his actual political stances on welfare to respond to that. Um, but he is definitely a very wealthy man. And um, I don't know, I'd have to look into that. But the elite, like the aristocracy, the nobility, the um, landowning elite, the wealthy in the cities of the colonies uh, were generally the ones who were in charge. They were generally the ones who um, 
had the political clout, they had the political positions, and one reason is because if you didn't have money, you couldn't serve because you didn't get paid, right? I mean, you had to pay your own way to serve um, to wherever, wherever you were going. If you had to go to Boston or whatever, you had to uh, support yourself, okay? Um, you might have gotten something from your, from your town or your community, but it wasn't anything that, uh, that somebody who was a farmer um, and actually had the farm and didn't have slaves or didn't have servants to farm for him, uh, it wasn't something that they could do. Okay? And so, um, your non-elite men were used to this during the revolution. They became used to this and they weren't going to change. And women had wanted more say-so. Who, which prominent woman um, requested that uh, the women were remembered by the framers of the Constitution? No, but that's a good guess. Oh, you guys. This woman, I read about this woman in fourth grade, and I still remember this woman. Uh, she's one of my favorite women in history, Abigail Adams. Okay? Very strong voice for women at this time. Um, but white women still had really no voice, no official voice. Do they have a voice behind the scenes? What do you think, Valdez? Okay, why not? Depends on who they talk to. Ah, it depends on who they talk to. Okay. It wasn't really valued. All right. Um, women, depending on where they were and who they were and who they were with, they might have a voice, okay? They might have a little bit of influence. Did they have a ton of influence? Depended on who their husband was, really, okay? And if their husband was listening to them. Abigail Adams, uh, John Adams did not include women, did he? In his writings, okay? Even though she was a very strong woman. so. There was some influence, a lot of the influence you'll see, you'll see that influence as we continue on in this, in the historical timeline where women uh, continue to gain some influence. Um, it's very, it's, it's very interesting to, to watch the progression of women, of natives, of um, free blacks, of, of blacks, slave blacks um, over time. And, you know, it's it's not always it's not always on a on an upward trajectory, okay? <laughs> you know, you you might hit a peak and then take a dive, um, and then you might come back. It's uh, it's not something that you could really map out very easily, all right? But the egalitarianism continued to grow between the the men and the the elites learned that they could no longer treat the other white males, the landowning white males, um, in the same manner. They would not be elected. Okay, they would not continue their power if they um, if they acted in that manner. Okay, now women also were, um, during wartime, they would follow their soldiers. Some of the wealthier women would follow their soldiers um, and they would help cook, they would help clean. The British Army was very um, strict in their cleanliness, okay? They made sure that you actually washed and that your clothes were washed, all right? Uh, the colonists did not. And you see, um, between, between the British army and the colonists, 
and, and the colonial army, the continental army, you would see more dysentery within the continentals because they they didn't have good hygiene, okay? They didn't cl keep a clean camp, and that added to the epidemics that they had um, and sicknesses. Because at any given time, you might have 20, 30, 40 percent of your troops sick and unable to fight because you had dysentery or yellow fever or smallpox going on, okay? So the, the women, especially in the British camps, were extremely valuable because they made sure that some of these things were carried out. That was another um, advantage of the British Army, is they, they understood that. Okay. And then the property also still of, of women, if you inherited property or if you came with property in your dowry, it was, um, it still would revert to the male. All right, so a revolution for black Americans. All right, in 1776, 20% of the U.S. population was black. Okay, 25,000 people were not slaves. Right. And then, but blacks were welcome or were they not welcome in the Continental Army? Dunsmore? Dunsmore in the British? Yes, go ahead, Emmanuel. I going to say it depends on what officer was nearby at the time. Um, somewhat. But what they did is they, uh, they changed their minds, okay? Washington did not want the blacks in the army, and then he agreed to have blacks. Uh, they didn't want to arm the blacks in South Carolina, and then they decided that they, they might arm the blacks in South, the, the slaves, okay, uh, to help fight. So, um, yeah, it didn't last very long. Washington banned the blacks in 1775, but six weeks later, he determined that free blacks could join the Continental Army. And by joining the Continental Army, they created mainly their own regiments, and they would create uh, black regiments. There was a Rhode Island regiment. Um, most blacks, however, were relegated to camp duties. And proportionally, many of them more of them got sick uh, than the whites because they were they they never got out of the camp and and uh, not keeping a clean camp means that the disease and the illness spread quite rapidly okay and so um, the abolition movement really was begun does it okay Define for me the abolition movement. What is that? The movement to end slavery? They can't hear you. That's why I keep repeating things. <laughs> the movement to end slavery. Yes, it was the movement to end slavery. And the movement to end slavery was started um, not completely, but especially by the Quakers, all right, the Society of Friends. And so between 1777 and 84, Vermont, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut started phasing out slavery. But where are those colonies located? In the north, yes, the east coast we call it now, but definitely in the north of the colonies, right? And so it didn't ban slavery, but it um, allowed for the, eman uh, the eventual emancipation of slaves. And emancipation of slaves means what? Complete freedom. Freedom, right. Manumission, which means you grant uh, freedom to a slave. Yes, 
Benjamin Franklin <coughs> was an abolitionist. <laughs> yes. Um, you'll see gradually how um, attitudes change toward slave and toward abolition and the abolition movement. And during the movement, the further we get into the movement, the, the more people are convinced that slaves should be free. Okay? And so by 1799, New York, and by 1804, New Jersey had um, started phasing out slavery. And by this means, with the gradual emancipation, if your child was born into slavery, your child would be born free. Okay? So that didn't mean that your child obviously could leave um, because you're not going to give an infant, you know, put the infant out on the street. But uh, the infant would be cared for and would likely still work in the same household. Even if you were free, you often stayed in the same household or one close by or one similar um, because very few people would actually hire you. Okay? <clears throat> so as, uh, as free persons, many of the slaves who, who were, or I should say many of the former slaves were pretty much destitute. They were considered the second class citizens and ended up really being laborers, servants, and, uh, and tenant farmers. Okay? Not unlike what they were doing in some cases prior to that, during slavery. However, they were free. And Prince Hall created a movement to um, to allow slaves and former slaves to move back to Africa. His movement didn't go very far because uh, it was expensive and because uh, many people who had been born here just weren't interested in going to Africa. Prince Hall. Okay? And um, it was mainly in the northern states but the black curfews were starting to be repealed and they started having equal court hearings, which is something that's significant. Okay, equal court hearings. Never before have slaves had an equal court hearing where you had a, ju a jury by trial. Okay? And when we get to the Civil War, you'll see more of that and then during and after during reconstruction after reconstruction really you'll see that being eliminated again all right so when i say that this trajectory um, changes you'll see a dramatic change especially for slaves after reconstruct during and after reconstruction okay so the next slide Um, Amanda, are you still with us? I can't see you, cause, so I just want to double check. Are you talking to me? Nope, but I'm glad you responded too. Amanda, are you still with us? Did you say my name? Yes, I did. Okay. Okay. All right. Great. All right. So Native Americans and the Revolution. How did the Native Americans fare during the Revolution? Not very well. Emmanuel. Pretty poorly. Pretty poorly. Okay. They. They became conflicted about what side they should support. All right. There were quite a few wars and treaties where smallpox, smallpox blankets were distributed um, by the British and by the Continentals. 
Yes. And that was the, the Continental Army under Sterling. Yes. Okay. So the Native Americans had a 50% drop in population during this time between 1754 and 1783. All right. Um, now think about it. Let's go back and think about there were millions of people here and then not so many. And it dropped 30, 40, 50, 90 percent. Population comes up a little bit, drops back it down another 30, 40 percent. Comes up, drops down another 30, 40. Comes up, drops down again. Okay, so during this time period, it drops another 50%. So, how many people do we really have? How many natives do we really have? Ah, do we really know? Very great, good question, and no, we don't have exact numbers. We can guess. Um, and, the, and the population drops are also an, uh, a guess. But you can count some of the different uh, villages. You can document the fact that certain villages were eliminated. And you can count that uh, some were pushed north or pushed west or gave up X number of, of lands. Right? So um, there are some figures out there. But to drop another 50% during this particular war, so we have hundreds of thousands left, not millions, okay? And so uh, most of them were east of the, had been east of the Mississippi River, but because of the dramatic population drop, you get an opportunity for what? Expansion. Expansion. And what else? Uh, land grabbing. Okay. Expansion. Um, and with that expansion came more tension between the natives and the colonists, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, even as the population is dropping, and even as they are losing land or um, signing treaties and signing land over, they still are holding on to cultures and they're still holding on to traditions. Okay? Um, some of them combine those cultures with the current cultures. Some of them, um, some of them did not. All right? Kind of depended on who they were and where they were. But what they wanted from Congress is the Chickasaws of the Mississippi Valley went to Congress and requested that they, um, they didn't request, they insisted that they continue to um, control their own homeland and keep their way of life. All right? And this isn't the last time that you'll see a native tribe go to Congress or go to the court system and try to go through um, different channels in order to retain their property and their way of life. Okay. So what they were doing is they were quit in this request the Chickasaws were requesting that they um, that the con uh, colonials would stop encroaching on their lands. Okay, any questions? Nope. Okay, moving on. From colonies to states, you've got Republicans and Democrats. Republicans and Democrats mean something today. And what did they mean then? Was it the same thing that we know of today? They, yes, they are different. In some cases, and you'll see, you'll see later when we start getting the political parties, that yes, it's it has been switched, um, but these aren't political parties. 
at the time. All right, because the framers of the Constitution didn't believe in political parties. All right, they didn't want political parties. They didn't believe that that should separate um, any of the citizens and the government. Okay, but the Republicans based their information and their beliefs on another system. Anybody want to take a stab at which system they based it on? We've talked about it before. The what? The British? No, not Republicans. Nobody remember? This was one of the um, most successful and largest empires in the world. Rome. Yes. They based it on the Roman Republic, where you had senators who worked for the good of all. Right? So, Republicans were um, trying to work for the good of all. Democrats, they were afraid of democracy because the elites associated democracy with what they called mobocracy and mobocracy, right? All right, so if you grant too much power to the people in a democratic society, you get a mob and you get a society that doesn't defer to their betters, and also um, that may be held hostage by not so altruistic Republicans or not so altruistic uh, politicians or governmental officials, right? Because if you are non-landowning, you can be your vote may be swayed more than if you are a landowner. What do you think of that? Amanda, what's your opinion on that? It doesn't get very many votes. You think it wouldn't get many votes? Not as many as it could have. Okay. Not as many as it could have. All right. Um, what the... Thank you. What they were afraid of is that um, as you were voting, and remember in Massachusetts and in the, in the Puritan colonies, you could vote, but it was an open vote, right? It was an outcry. And so if you were non-landowner and the person that you were a tenant farmer for was standing there and you didn't vote for him, what do you think would happen to your land? and your tenant farmer status. You might conceivably be kicked off the land? What's that? It's just privileges have been revoked. <laughs> yes. Yes. Privileges could could very well be revoked. Okay. So <clears throat> um, that's those are some of the things that they were they were facing at this time, and how they were trying to uh, trying to make sure that they they kept a system that was beneficial, okay, and they really truly in I would say ninety percent of the cases they were truly trying to make things better for at least all free white men in the system, in the new system, okay? And so as they create these states, they had some similarities between them and, and Britain. They kept the bicameral legislatures, all right, which many actually mirrored parliament, okay? You have the lower house and the upper house, all right? Um, they also, what they called um, them in the upper house is what? 
Well, it is the upper house of our legis of our Congress. The Senate. Thank you. Right. The Senate, which is a Republican ideal. Right. So you see how they're kind of integrating these ideas in. And so the assembly, um, which is the lower house, was voted in by popular vote. All right. And the upper house or council appointed by a governor or chosen by the assembly. So there was a separate representation by the upper house and the common people. All right. So even though um, the politicians couldn't put on airs, they still were instituting a, a system that, that did keep, some, keep people separate, right? All right, so... Um, Another similarity to Britain is that there was property ownership to vote. Nine out of 13 states reduced the amount of uh, property that they needed in order to be elected, but none of them abolished that requirement. And remember, uh, when Massachusetts started as a colony, it was, oh, you could vote if you were part of the church, but after their charters were revoked, well, I don't know, how many times did their charters get revoked? A couple? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> well, at least two. Um, so as their charters were revoked, that had changed, remember, to a land-owning voter population. And so when they, when they set that up, they had a, um, another similarity to the to the British system is that you had a vote for every town. Okay, so think about all these towns. Think about Alaska today. If every town had a vote in the legislature, would that change the face of our legislature? I'm getting some nods. Okay. If that changed, um, let's pick on New Jersey. If New Jersey, if every town in New Jersey had a vote, would that change uh, how things were done in New Jersey, how business was accomplished? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, because in 1920, we became an urban society. At this time, we were a rural society. So if you had a rural, um, a rural vote, and you had the majority of it was a rural vote, the urban vote didn't count. So think of Boston with one vote, and think of Sudbury with one vote. Okay, see the difference? Now, is that different today? I guess it is. Yes, it is, because it's more based on the population so Boston probably has 20, and Sudbury has one, right? Okay, so um, Pap, uh, Pennsylvania was the only one at this time to base their, um, their voting registration logs by population, okay? So... You can, you can see how vastly different uh, the Republic of the United States would be today if that system was still in place. So state constitutions was another dif was a difference from the British system because state constitutions were written and every state constitution had a Bill of Rights. That was written. Okay? A written Bill of Rights. And with the document that was written, it limited powers, right? It limited powers, it defined powers, it defined citizens and citizenship and their uh, liberties, okay? It outlined at least some of the liberties, okay? And most of the state constitutions dramatically um, reduced the governor's 
abilities and his responsibilities and his duties and his authority. Okay? Pennsylvania eliminated the governor position altogether. So where was the power? In these early states, where was the power? representation but what part of government had the had the power very good it's the house the assemblies in the legislature the le legislature had all the power pretty much okay which worried some of the Republicans okay so um, the Assemblies had traditionally in the colonies held a lot of power because they held the power of the purse, right? They couldn't, uh, they could technically even sway the governor because they had the power of the purse. <laughs> that, that kind of got sideswiped by the king on multiple occasions, as, as you recall. But um, that's where the people wanted to put their power. They didn't want the power to lie in the governor because most of the governors that they had had had, um, had either abused their power or they had used their power in a way that the colonists didn't feel uh, was befitting of the colonies. Okay? So this fear of this centralized authority, a.k.a. governor in this case, or a.k.a. Um, what we now would call president, this was totally rooted in their, their experience with the king. Okay? So the states who had the governors, all but Pennsylvania, elected their governors. All right? Something else that wasn't always accomplished under the king. But the governors had no appointing powers. They had no rights to veto any laws. Um, they were subject to impeachment, which was new, right? Does everybody know what impeachment is? Where you're removed from office? Very good. Okay. Yes, first, forcefully. Everyone was afraid of a centralized government. Mm -hmm. So, um, the wealthy colonists changed the laws gradually to, um, to reflect a more centralized authority and, and wealth, okay? So they increased property requirements. They changed legislative districts by, um, by property values. They gave the governor some appointment and veto power. All right, Massachusetts, under uh, the document that John Adams wrote mostly, was the first, and others fell in line after that. Um, was there another reason for this to happen? Besides the fact that they just didn't, um, they hadn't wanted it before? Any ideas? How about a lack of leadership? When you have an assembly and you have too large of a group, do they often come to a consensus? Not always. Exactly. But if you have someone to help lead the group, or to give some direction, or to um, give some input to the group, it often helps. And so the, the elite, the wealthy um, of the colonies, decided that they would, would like a little more input. And with that, uh, with that input, they thought a governor would be a person who would be valuable in that system. 
And today, we still have the same system. Do you see a value in having a governor of a state? What do you think, Valdez? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it is helpful to have someone with a vision who um, helps lead um, as well as uh, work with the assembly or the legislature. Right? Okay, so this is one of the reasons that, um, that things change. And so formalizing the confederation, you had still, even with the appointments or the, uh, the election of governors, you have this widespread concern for the central authority, okay? Because you have a potential for corruption, you have a potential for tyranny, um, and this is what you just got rid of, right? You spent how many years fighting to get rid of? Right? They're not going to allow it to happen again. So they're very, um, they're very hesitant to let that happen again. And so they had, uh, they had the power still lying within the legislature, but they were creating a, a system where you had another leader that helped um, help navigate those those waters as as an elected governor, and then, but you still have states who are all about the states, okay, and states' rights, okay, and the colonies. Remember, this the colonies were all separate to begin with, right? I mean, they they had different charters. They had different leaders. They had learned from previous colonies what worked better and, you know, what to do not to starve uh, or, or hopefully not to starve, right? And so still as we're forming this confederation, you still have all of, it's all about states' rights. And it's all about... Um, having this independence right so John Dickinson if you recall one of the uh, men who did not sign the Declaration of Independence still worked within the system and he came up with the Articles of Confederation okay and in the Articles of Confederation it's not totally his work it's based on his work okay but it was sent to the states to ratify in 1777. Okay, are we still at war? Yes, yes, we are still at war. All right, it took four years to ratify. From 1776 to 1781, Maryland was a holdout, okay? One of the big disputes was over representation voting and then western lands that were claimed by some states and claimed by the same claim same land was claimed by different states okay so um, ratification was delayed until maryland signed it in march on march 1st of 1781 right and that's when the congress of the confederation came into being and when did we sign the treaty Treaty of Paris? Yes! 1783! Thank you! <laughs> I'm like, oh, you have to at least remember one date! 1783! <laughs> Alright? So, um... <laughs> so, it reserves states' rights there was sovereignty, freedom, and independence within the Articles of Confederation. And all states had separate powers, which might create some issues, don't you think? If those separate powers were used and somebody else used the same power in the same circum under the same circumstances? Hmm. Yeah. So, um, nationally, they had one chamber in Congress, 
it was elected by the state legislatures and every state had one vote. Okay? And then Congress could request funds from the states. So they're requesting funds from the states to fund the, say, the Continental Army. Okay? Do they get the funds from the states? No. No. And the states started reducing the amount of funds that they did send. All right, so a few problems you can see emerging from the uh, from the Articles of Confederation. There were no taxes unless everyone agreed. Not everybody agreed. There were no taxes levied by the, um, the by the Confederation. Okay. Um, it also didn't regulate interstate or overseas commerce. Every state could do their own. Okay, so. Um, it was very limited, very limited power, but it, that was legitimate, right? I mean, it, it was written in and it was in direct response to an, what they saw as an abuse of power prior to that. Okay? So, the Articles of Confederation um, were idealistic in their writing in their framers, um, in reality, did they work out so well? No. How many states were there? How many colonies did we have? Thirteen. Thirteen. Mm -hmm. We haven't added any yet. Okay. So again, and also with the articles, there was no executive branch, no judicial branch. So you only had Congress. Um, all right. Questions? Did the states have judicial? Or? Yes. Yes, they did. And so their governors originally had been able to appoint judges, but then their state legislatures were able to appoint judges. Okay, that was one of the powers that had been eliminated from most governors. Is appoint appointment. Okay, so here you've all seen this, and I know you all remember it from the Constitution Day, right? Here you go, the Articles of Confederation. Da -da -da -da. And here's the article. Here are the articles signed. Da -da -da -da. John Hancock's up there in the top right. Can you see it? Okay. And, you know, we pick on John Hancock, um, but as one of the wealthiest colonists, for him to sign first and for him to sign in such a flourish and for him to be willing to risk everything that he had, it helped everyone else sign below him. Okay. And, of course, I'm referring mainly to the uh, Declaration of Independence. But, him also signing the Articles of Confederation also made an impact. All right, so financing. Finance, trade, and the economy. How was the economy doing? Pretty bad. Pretty bad. You're starting to see another recession. Um, the... Confederation couldn't raise any money. Uh, their financier said, hmm, maybe we should come up with something to help raise some money. And Morris and Alexander Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton is a, is a hoot. I don't know if any of you have read anything about Alexander Hamilton, but he cracks me up. And if you go, Here's a here's a nice little sidebar. If you go to the Constitution Center in Philadelphia, they have a uh, a statue. They have a, a room full of statues, and Alexander Hamilton is like my height because <laughs> I have this picture of me with Alexander Hamilton. All right, um, but he was a he was a feisty one, and he and Morris came up with the Newburgh conspiracy. Okay, and with that. 
they were threatening, they convinced some officers to threaten a coup d'etat unless the National Treasury could raise some revenue. And the National Treasury was from the Confederate, from the Articles, right, or from the Confederation, okay? Washington found out about it, and he was able to give a speech that convinced his officers not to follow through, okay? So, not only was Washington a, uh, a general, but he was... He was definitely a diplomat, and uh, one of the interesting things that I have, one of the most interesting things that I've ever read about Washington is that he felt that um, his diplomatic skills had never been challenged more than had been challenged by his wife's children. He had to use more diplomacy with his children than he had to use in any state function. Okay, and this is after he becomes president. Okay, <laughs> so so Washington um, has written this letter, and and uh, he had asked, and he had um, asked his officers to uphold their honor, basically, and they did, and so. Uh, the uh, conspiracy fell through, but it really demonstrated this um, the the opportunity and the uh, the great financial straits, the dire straits financially that the Confederation was in. Okay, when when you have when you have the director of finance come up with a conspiracy to try to get people to to pay up. That's a little extreme, don't you think? I mean, would you think it was extreme today if somebody came up with such a conspiracy? Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> well, Emmanuel, I would hope that you would think it was extreme if somebody came up with a conspiracy to, <laughs> to get payment <laughs> and to pay for the government. Um, but it also demonstrated vul vulnerability of these political um, institutions, okay? The um, taxes, this was in 83, the Newburgh conspiracy. In 83 also, taxes were vetoed by New York, all right? And this is when the state started um, not contributing as much to the National Confederation, right? And the, the Depression, or the recession led to a depression in the in New England. Um, the middle states were doing okay with their trade, and the South uh, switched crops. So the economy also was was more regional, um, but the economy wasn't great, and neither was the economy within the Confederation. So the Confederation says, well. Um, we're going to talk about the Ordinance of 1785 and come up with uh, some way to raise money. And in the West, Britain and Spain were supporting Indian nations to strengthen their own positions. Right? Congress wanted to sell land for money. Okay? So states ceded 160 million acres north of the Ohio River. And so what they did is they came out with the Ordinance of 1785. Can anybody tell me what that's all about? Establish procedures for surveying the land. Yes. Establish procedures for surveying the land. The Ordinance of 1785 and the way that they're laying the land out is still used today. All right? So... The way that they've outlined land in townships, the way that they have drawn um, drawn the land in, in grids is still used today. And if you look at land status, I should bring in my land status, one of my land status maps if I can find them. When you look at land status, you see all these big squares, right? Has anyone ever seen land status maps? 
No? Some? Okay. Anybody use topographical maps? Yeah. Okay. All right. You know how they're all outlined in a grid? Those are all surveyed. All right. But that doesn't mean that they've been surveyed on the ground. Okay. That means they might just be plat surveyed. And plat surveyed means that they've just been, the lines have been drawn on a map. Doesn't necessarily mean somebody's been out and actually surveyed the corners. All right. In Alaska, we have a lot of land that is still unsurveyed. Most land outside is surveyed. And so um, the survey instructions that they came up with were, of course, one of the most important and lasting aspects of the Confederation, as well as the Northwest Ordinance. What's the, uh, what's the Northwest Ordinance? And organizing new states. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So you have a way for states, for um, new territory to become states. How important is that? Very important. Would you say? Okay. Right on. Okay. I see. I see nodding. Good. Good. I like it. Okay. State claims to western lands and state secessions to the federal government. Okay, look at that land ceded by Massachusetts. Okay, you look at Massachusetts, Massachusetts, but then you have New York in between Massachusetts, and why did Massachusetts claim that land? Right? Okay, so this is getting back to what I was talking about, where people were arguing over what they claimed. Because look at this, look at this map. Isn't, isn't this a fun map? I mean, look, ceded by Connecticut in 1786, and then they ceded some more. Okay? So Pennsylvania didn't get to claim it, but Connecticut did. And then look at New York. New York's land doesn't even adjoin New York. Of course, Massachusetts and Connecticut don't either. Right? Uh, Virginia land was ceded to Kentucky. And if you look at it, it's the state of Kentucky. And then uh, seated by North Carolina in 1790, what's the state right under Kentucky now? Tennessee. Tennessee. Very good. Um, looks very similar to the to the land status of Tennessee now, right? Okay. Seated by Georgia, by South Carolina to Georgia. Look at that little patch there. South Carolina. So you see where uh, the colonies were taking advantage of the opportunity to expand their territory. So if, if an individual state um, claims more territory, what do they gain by that? Amanda, any ideas? Sorry, I keep walking out of the screen. Okay, more people can live there so you can tax more people. More land ownership, more votes. Okay. All of the above. All right. Land at this time means power, right? Pretty much. Land equals power. How about today? Land equal power? To a degree. If depends you're a celebrity. on what's that? But if you're a celebrity. If you're a celebrity. Okay. No, it really depends on who has the land. I mean Alaska is bigger than any other state. Uh huh. It depends on resources. Can you all hear? 
Yeah. Okay. Yes. Zoning and what you can do with the land. Okay. How much of it, which equals power, right? Basically, it's boiling down to power. How much land do you think in the state of Alaska is owned by the state of Alaska? There are 365.5 million acres in Alaska. How much of it do you think the state owns? What's that? They own, I was going to say we own about 20%. Okay. Native land, there's federal land, there's state land, and there's private land. Private land is less than 1% of the state. 44 million acres is owned um, by, or the actually, the native corporations have the ability to own 44 million acres. They do not have title to all 44 million acres. The state of Alaska has the ability to own 104 million acres. They currently do not hold title to all 104 million acres either. So the federal government has ended up and still has control of 65% of the state of Alaska in land. Okay? And so um, when you look at the lands and the land seeding that they seeded, their goal in claiming that land was for the settlers, it was for the economy, it was for the visions, okay? Um, it was for the power. Ah, great question. The reason for that is when Alaska became a state in 1959, and you'll also get the opportunity to, to finish this conversation next semester. When Alaska became a state in 1959, they were able to claim and to map out where they wanted land. Okay, you could choose the land. Um, with ANCSA, with the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act, the natives were able to choose their land as well. Some of that land has overlapped, and so some of the land that the native corporations hold or would like to own is some of the land that the state also would like to own, okay? And so it has to be determined, and it's done by BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, who will get final title to that. And there's some negotiation that goes along with that, okay? It depends on traditional usage. There's a whole list of requirements that that need to be met for that. They are changing still. Yes. Um, they tried to speed it up. Senator Murkowski had an acceleration act passed where all the land was supposed to be transferred by 2009. A good portion of it was, but it is not all done. Okay. So here you have the um, does that make sense? It's kind of confusing, but land status and land, again, we get back to the, to the very beginning of the colonies, and land was one of the reasons for the colonies, right? Okay, so land status is extremely important. Surveying this land was extremely important, okay? So you have 36 sections in a township and a township is listed here in the squares and the squares are taken and um, done by by miles so um, if you look at land status it's very definitive um, until you get to the curvature of the earth and if anybody's has anybody been to mccarthy yeah. okay um, that's a really fun place to go if you're looking at land status because it's where the map kind of goes, crashes together. And so the uh, perfect squares don't work in McCarthy. All right. 
All right, so any questions? All right, so treaties and land, all right? The available land was, of course, native land. And even though it had just been claimed by Connecticut, it was owned by natives, the majority was owned by natives, right? So the Treaty of Fort Stanwix and the Treaty of Fort McIntosh and the Treaty of Fort Finney were all signed. However, not all the natives held that they were valid treaties because negotiations were held not always with all of the um, all of the people uh, in agreement. And so in Stanwix, the Iroquois gave half of their land, ceded half their land. Uh, the McIntosh and the Delaware, okay, and um, the McIntosh was with the Delaware in natives, and the Treaty of Fort Finney was the Shawnee, where all of them gave up different land. But um, the British, who the Indians were hoping would still support them, the British actually refused to abandon seven of their northwest forts because they did hope to regain territory and they hoped to regain lands in North America. Okay? And uh, Brandt, one of the natives, one of the more um, famous natives, he worked on it, but he couldn't unite the people and he had to withdraw to the to the north again. Spain also was working on supplying ammo to the Creeks in Georgia so that they could fight against the colonists or the, the Confederation now. Okay? So, um, the Northwest Ordinance, does that make sense? Yeah? And the Northwest Ordinance gave uh, a way for states to become states, gave a, gave a delineation of how you could become a state. So you had a three-stage method for being admitted as a new state in the Union, okay? You'd get a congressionally appointed governor, you'd have a secretary, you'd have judges, You'd have an assembly and a non-voting delegate to Congress, okay? But then with the second phase, as you came in, when your population reached 5,000, okay, and free male inhabitants, and a state constitution could be drafted and membership to the union would be requested in the third phase when the population reached 60,000, okay? And... Um, this is one lasting, um, one thing that lasted from the Confederation that dramatically changed the face of the, con the Confederation and, and our nation is how they were admitting states and the fact that they did admit new states. Okay? So... You saw the in the, on the map where they ceded the land to Kentucky as a new state, right? All right, so I think we're going to get cut off here at Shay's Rebellion. Oh, no, we have a couple more minutes. Okay, so Shay's Rebellion. What about Shay's Rebellion? Was it important? Ah. Internally. Okay. All right. It wasn't exactly the first one, but it was a major one. And it was the first major one. And it was a, uh, it was one that, that involved armories and munitions and uh, the militia. Right? And so in New England, with their depression, they had this huge tax hike on top of their depression. And so farmers rebelled in 1786. And with this rebellion, they shut down six counties' court systems. Right? That's significant when you can shut down 
part of the government. All right? So if you're able to shut down part of the government, Washington is like, uh, we have a problem. We have a potential problem here. Uh, what's going to happen? And what if they go, uh, what if they go too far? Right? Again, they talk about mobocracy. They talk about mobs taking over. And this is a very uh, common thought pattern. You know, this was the, the Sons of Liberty had the same concerns in Boston, correct? Right. All right. So in 1787, they marched um, against a federal arsenal in Springfield, Massachusetts. They were defeated by the military. But guess what? They won because they got um, elected into the Mag Massachusetts legislature and they cut taxes and they pardoned Shea. All right? So this rebellion doesn't really stop. Okay, and this is important to understand that Washington not only is looking at this as, um, as a potential problem, the first real national problem, um, but how far does a rebellion go? You know, we've rebelled and we say we're done, but obviously we're not done because people are doing the same thing over some of the same issues. Right? Okay. So they uh, determined, the elites determined that they really needed a strong national government. And so they got together because they saw this, uh, this potential combustion uh, that, that they really believed might actually happen. And so when they got together, they decided they were going to, um, they got together in Maryland and they decided, no, we're going to invite everybody and we're going to go to Philadelphia. Um, and address this. We are going to recommend amending the Articles of Confederation because we need to do something or we might lose everything that we just fought for. Okay. Do you think they could have lost it? Everything they had just fought for? Probably. They, they may were, very well have. It depended. Um, you know, how far is too far? How far do you go? Uh, do you have enough states' rights? Are you getting taxed uh, too much? All things that they had all fought for before, and now they weren't. Now it wasn't okay, right? The farmers? No, the farmers weren't um, weren't always Republicans because the Republicans. They, they might have been, but general, generally they were more Democrats. They believed that they should be equal to anyone else in the legislature. No, it was the Republicans who were afraid of the democracy, which was part of the democracy. Yeah. Very good question. Okay, anything else? All right, we're going to start on the Philadelphia Convention, and we'll do Chapter 7 on Tuesday. Today, Thursday? Thursday, thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right, anything else? Any questions? All right, then I will see you all on Thursday. Thank you. <laughs> Good thing I asked people to keep me straight.